It's Melanie White here on the Sage Women podcast, and I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Sarah Mackay. Sarah, welcome, and thanks for being here today. Oh, thanks for the invitation to chat. I'm really excited because you're doing very important work, and maybe you could start by giving us a little bit of backstory about who you are and what you do. Oh, it's always very self-indulgent to get to talk a little bit about yourself and your work. So it's my, my trade is in neuroscience. So I have a PhD in neuroscience and spent a number of years working as a neuroscience researcher and medical research looking at brain plasticity. So how the brain changes and is shaped during the course of development. And I also worked um, for a while looking at spinal cord injury research. Um, about 15 years ago, I um, reluctantly left academia um, which I did love. I really loved bench research, but I wanted to set up my own business as a, a science communicator. So I did that really specializing in all things brain. So now I like to say I explain the brain. Um, so I've written a couple of books, sort of popular science books for everyone on women's brain health, one kind of a woman's brain health from womb to tomb and another looking specifically at the neurobiology of pregnancy and motherhood. Um, and I also teach a number of professional development training programs and applied neuroscience and brain health and just generally speak and share my love of all things neuroscience. That's amazing. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about your books and your uh, courses a bit later in this episode. But why brains? Like what got you interested in neuroplasticity? Oh, well, I've got, a, I've got a little prop here. So when I was in a first year psychology lecture back in 1993, so 30 years ago now, the lecturer recommended we read this book. And anyone who's read this book or come across this book, it's called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks, will know why I became interested in the brain. It's kind of a bit of a Gen X sort of classic now. Um, Oliver Sacks was a neurologist who wrote these amazing case studies about all of the curious things that went wrong with his patients when things went wrong with their brains. And the man who mistook his wife for a hat used to mistake everyday objects for other objects and in this instance thought his wife is a hat. Um, anyway, I was in a Psych 101 lecture 30 years ago and we were told about this book. And so I, I went and got the book and was just like, get out. This stuff is fascinating. And the same sort of series of lectures in, in Psych 101, this was at Canterbury University in 1993 in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, we also learned about synapses. And I'd never come across a synapse before, those the connections between two neurons in the brain. And I just thought it was the most fascinating thing I had ever heard. So I changed universities to wow. Otago University in, in Dunedin in New Zealand, where they had just started a degree program in neuroscience that year. Mm. Um, and so that was 30 years ago. And I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard about. And 30 years later, I still think, like even today I saw a newly published paper that came out looking at the UK Biobank, which is this consortium of about 40,000 people's brain scans which have just been published for open access well, I mean, for scientists to kind of analyze. And I was like, get out, this is so cool. So, you know, that love and fascination um, and just the ability to be curious because there's always something new to learn and discover is kind of what's sort of just kept me on that, on that course ever since, whether it's been within, you know, education, research, mm -hmm. science, communications, writing, speaking. Um, anything brain is just pretty cool. Your face really lights up when you talk about it. Yeah, who, who's lucky enough to figure that out, you know, in their first year of uni and have oh, it carry yeah. through? <laughs> Hardly anybody. Yeah, when I went to uni, a bit of first years dropped out because they realised that they were in the wrong course. It's mm -hmm. really interesting that you found something that was so exciting. And I heard you mention curiosity. It must be a key part of really wanting to understand something so complex as the brain. Mm. Well, I mean, there's always, there's, I mean, there's a ton of very smart people out there in academia doing this work and sharing it. And, you know, there's always something new that they're finding out. And I just, you know, and kind of building, building on the knowledge. And, and I think also now it makes me feel really old to say, but to like kind of look back across your career and, and to see how ideas have kind of come and gone or been built and, and especially at the moment, because there's a lot of new technology, there's a lot of scientists have decided to cooperate and they're like sharing data and, and sharing, yeah. you know, sort of 
the, these biobanks and now we've kind of got the emergence of AI and machine learning within mm. um, the research space, which is then allowing for this really powerful analysis of the data to be done that's yeah. starting to reveal um, all of this, this, these amazing things about the brain. And also we can ask questions that we couldn't necessarily ask before because we couldn't answer them with, you know, one kind of person in a lab calculating things on an Excel spreadsheet. So, so it continues to be very exciting. I love that. And, and so let's talk a little bit about menopause and yeah, <laughs> on, you've, you've done a book on motherhood and the brain, but getting a little bit older, us women in Gen X who are approaching menopause, got the brain fog, forgetting things, wondering if we've got early onset dementia, mm. there's all this stuff happening to us. What's going on? Sarah? <laughs> Can you help well, us? Yeah. I think, first of all, what's really interesting is a lot of women going through perimenopause, which is, you know, when the hormone sort of starts going up and down, up and down in the years before your final period, which is classified as menopause. Um, lots of women do start to experience a whole range of symptoms. And it seems right now there's like hundreds of them, right? Yeah. The brain fog forgetfulness thing is, is, is super important to understand because when we bring all these women into the research lab and do all the battery of cognitive testing and test memory and attention and reaction speed, et cetera, we're not really seeing a significant cognitive decline in these women, which is really, really good news. We yeah. see the same in pregnancy women or early motherhood women who are saying, oh, I've got baby brain, I'm really forgetful. Let's bring them into the research lab and we're not picking up cognitive decline. Excellent news. We would not want to be picking up cognitive decline because then we would really be worrying about do women when they experience pregnancy <laughs> or any kind of next phase of life become you know, mind. <laughs> slightly demented. That's not the case. Yeah. So there are these subjective experiences of feeling fuzzy or foggy but they're not necessarily this this we're not necessarily seeing these kind of neurological markers that we would see in someone with alzheimer's disease and dementia and i and i can't tell you how good that news is both for pregnancy and for perimenopause some women get a bit disappointed when i tell them that it's like it's good we don't we don't want cognitive decline good news so what's kind of going on it, it, we, there's, there's a whole lot going on we all know that there's a lot going on i think um, the simplest way to describe what we know about what is happening to our brains is to think about what menopause actually is from a kind of a physiological and neurological perspective. So we know that menopause, and it seems to be shifting later, there's data coming out recently that actually lots of women are still having their periods up until their mid-50s. So it used to be 50, 50 on average, but we're starting to see a bit of a shift yeah. Um, in some Western countries to a little bit later, and that appears to be tied with overall better health and well-being, education, higher econ socioeconomic status. Yeah. What, what, what's what's stuff. underlying that? We don't know, but that's kind of, you know, again, not bad news. It depends kind of what your perspective is on periods, right? Um, so what happens is that basically eggs get old and they run out. <laughs> and all through your kind of reproductive life from puberty through to now, your ovaries and your brain have been having this lovely com cyclical conversation every month. For most women, it's pretty pretty rhythmic, pretty predictable, except when you're pregnant or perhaps if you have been taking hormonal contraceptives. Yeah. Um, but what happens when your ovaries get old and the eggs sort of stop being released is that conversation sort of starts to falter a bit. And the messages from the ovaries up to the brain may not be heard one month. They may be very kind of quiet and the brain goes what did you say <laughs> this is in it this is a, a metaphor the brain's going what did you say to the ovaries and the ovaries are going sorry we'll release a bit more estrogen so the next month the estrogen goes way up and then the brain's going not that much and so what we tend to see <laughs> with that type of physiological feedback loop is we see these kind of ups quite quite significant fluctuations of of hormones and that's is having an impact on the brain. And what is happening in the brain is responsible for a lot of the sort of felt symptoms that women have. Not necessarily every symptom, but but a lot. Particularly we understand physiologically what's happening when women have hot flashes or issues with thermoregulation. Yeah. Um, flat my shirt here is a way mm -hmm. of describing that. Um, so deep inside our brain is a part of the brain called the hypothalamus and it's very busy and it's constantly receiving information from our body about things like, you know, your, your pH or your heart rate or 
your hormone levels. So it's receiving the information from your ovaries and it also monitors um, body temperature. Mm-hmm. And the o- and and the estrogen kind of plays a role in sort of setting this little thermostat in our hypothalamus. And it's kind of got a set top point and a bottom point. And what happens is most of your pre-menopausal life, when you get too hot, you behave in ways to cool yourself down and you you get hot. You know, you sweat, you try and release heat and you take your clothes off. What happens during perimenopause in some women is that kind of top level goes down a bit. And so your body temperature only needs to rise just a tiny, tiny little bit for it to kind of go above that t- top set point. Mm-hmm. And your brain's going gosh, it's hot in here and sort of sends off this kind of almost alert to your body saying it's just got really, really, really hot. Even if your body's kind of cycling within that standard temperature. Right, it's like um, your, um, your it's tolerance like panic, goes down. It's almost like panic stations. Yeah. And so you then your body then tries frantically to cool you down as quick as possible, which is where the hot flash comes because it's trying to release body heat, even if you're not necessarily super hot, but your body temperature just went up slightly. Um, so you get that kind of very, very powerful physiological response. And then, of course, the behavioral response that goes with that, which is to try and take your clothes off and cool yourself down. And then sitting alongside that, of course, is the meaning that you are making in your mind about that response. Some women find it very, very distressing, very, mm-hmm. very stressful, depending on where they are and the context that they're in. Other mm-hmm. women are like, oh, gosh, whatever, I'm just a bit hot. Yeah. So there's 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 uh, there's the different components. There's the physiological component, the kind of behavioural component, and then almost the psychological and emotional component of that. Um, and and the same kind of happens for for getting cooler, but that does appear to vary a lot more. Some women become more sensitive to the cold. Others others don't so much. Now we know that. Um, that's regulated by estrogen because if you put estrogen back in using hormone therapies whether it's the contraceptive pill and perimenopausal woman or you know mht Mm -hmm. um and postmenopausal woman then it usually regulates itself and it becomes the brain doesn't go into this blind panic Mm -hmm. that it does when your temperature rises a little bit so that's kind of the the neurophysiology of the hot flashes (laughs) what about some of the other symptoms well one thing that's important to realize is that sleep and body temperature are like intimately entwined Mm. and people are usually quite familiar with the idea that when the sun goes down and it gets dark melatonin is released from our brain and melatonin tells our body to get ready to go to sleep it's not Mm. a sleeping tablet in our brain or a sleeping medicine essentially gets us physiologically in a state to fall asleep and one of those things that it does to help us fall asleep is to again heat loss so as our body temperature cools down we tend to fall asleep that's why when it's really hot, it's harder to cool down and it's harder to fall asleep. Or when you're really, really cold, it's harder to fall asleep because what you actually want is the drop in temperature. So we, we kind of have an intuitive understanding of body temperature and sleep. Now, when you're perimenopausal and you've got thermoregulation issues, you're probably going to have sleep issues. Even if you're not waking up, even if your brain isn't going panic stations, panic stations, it's hot in here and jolting you awake from sleep to try and cool you down. Mm. Um, your sleep architecture, so that kind of pattern of deep deep sleep, light sleep through the night becomes disrupted. Mm. And that means you just don't feel as good the next day. Yeah. And if you haven't had a good night's sleep, well, what's the inevitable consequences of that? You kind of feel fuzzy, you feel foggy, you're less emotionally regulated. You crave sugar. <laughs> it happens for a week, happens for a month, happens for a year. So so many of the symptoms that women experience, we could in part perhaps tie back Mm. sleep disruption even if women aren't waking up yeah sleep architecture might be disrupted mm-hmm. so that's kind of one sort of physiological scenario that we kind of understand from the perspective of the brain oh. mm. and there's some other there's some other things i can get into as well don't know how much time we've got and well is there maybe one other thing that you could share on that it would be great yeah so um We've only just sort of passed the two-year anniversary of the first study that was published looking to see what happens to women's brains as they go through kind of pre, peri, menopause, post-menopause. And that was published by Lisa Moscone, um, who is a, a researcher in the US who kind of took lots of MRI images 
of what happens to the structure of women's brains kind of across that time and actually compared them to men's brains through over the same period of time. So they could see is what of this is kind of due to chronological age and what of this is due to kind of endocrinological changes. What what you know what are the changes we'd see in our neurobiology if we did not have a change in, in hormones. And what they do see are some really interesting changes in terms of gray matter, which is kind of the wrinkly outer cortex of the brain. Actually gets a bit fatter it actually kind of grows slightly hmm. so you know it's not all you know dismay and despair <laughs> it's not all wastage and you know dysfunction and decline actually the gray matter kind of plumps up a bit which is good right. news we don't quite know why and what that means perhaps it's the downloading of wisdom perhaps it's you know matriarchal cortical development who knows we don't quite That's know right <laughs> it's good news who knew there was good news but there is what and what she said there's a lot of changes that have been mapped in brains of women through this time and what we see is perimenopause is kind of a time of change it's almost like adolescence it's this kind of phase of change and then everything kind of levels out kind of after the menopause it's like the brain then kind of adjusts and adapts because that's what brains do they retain plasticity they retain their ability to when they're healthy to adapt and respond to kind of changing circumstances including our changing hormonal circumstances and then they kind of settle down again. There are some changes in terms of glucose metabolism, yeah. which is also reflected in an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes after menopause. But in terms of how the brain kind of metabolizes glucose, it becomes a little less efficient. Mm -hmm. But there are compensatory mechanisms in place in terms of neuronal metabolism to kind of account for that. Okay. And it may be that those kind of adjustments that are taking place metabolically in the brain during that time, maybe they might account for some of the kind of almost cognitive fatigue that some women may experience or that kind of what we might call colloquially brain fog. Mm. But the good news is we're not seeing we're not seeing cognitive decline during that time. We're actually kind of seeing pretty pretty stable levels of cognition um, through that through that phase of life. Right. So it's a there's a bit of kind of menopausal good news story. Yeah, so like a perceived cognitive decline, but not an actual. Um, like people might think that they've got all these things going on, but there's no evidence of serious lasting. No. No, I mean, if we look at populations of women, no, I mean, there might be some women, but maybe they, that that may that may that doesn't appear to be related to the menopause. And it's a bit like baby brain. We're bringing women into the research lab who say, "I'm forgetful, I'm fuzzy, fuzzy I'm foggy." We go, "There's nothing wrong with you cognitively, neurologically. You are intact and healthy." What women in pregnancy and motherhood are doing is using the word "baby brain" to describe there is a lot going on. Yeah. I'm just kind of on the steep learning curve. I can't cope. And, and and they've almost been primed, you know, with this gender stereotype their whole lives that when you've got a brain and it's a female brain, you add some hormones in or take some hormones out, that automatically equals cognitive dysfunction and emotional instability. So women are going in pregnancy and motherhood at least, oh, well, it's my brain that's at fault when actually it's probably a, a social support issue. I'm not saying the same thing is happening in menopause because we are seeing perhaps reasons as to why some women might be experiencing fogginess and fuzziness, but it's probably more likely related to sleep disturbance. Yeah. Perhaps this adjustment of the brain during this point in time. Um, so I think it's quite reassuring to know it's it's not the first signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, it's, ab it's absolutely not. It might feel, it might feel that way. But, I mean, there's a lot coming at you at this phase of life as well, an awful lot coming at you. And now there's, like, a whole lot more news about menopause coming at you too that you've kind of got to make meaning of in terms of, you know, what's happening in your own body and your perceptions of self. Yeah, and interesting as you're talking about pregnancy, I'm thinking about the la lack of sleep during pregnancy and perhaps even a, a greater ancient biological driver of needing to look after the children. I mean, I'm just speculating <laughs> here, but... Let's put all the resources into that and not allow yeah. you to multitask on a hundred other things. But of course, well, as you said, there are a hundred exactly. other things going on anyway, just with the baby or just with going through menopause. Yeah. And and memory, what we remember depends on our attention. So what information we take in and what we filter out. Mm -hmm. And you're a new mum. You've got you've got like a whole new human 
who you have to look after and your and your brain has been primed to focus solely in on that new little baby and reading their social cues. So it's hardly surprising you're not going to remember the things that you don't pay attention to. And I think midlife women are also going through, you know, an awful lot. You know, you might, I, I've got teenagers, I've got aging parents. Me and my husband have aging parents in three different countries in the world. Um, wow. but we now have to kind of look at you know kind of support and, and look after and then kind of try and raise teenage boys going through you know one of them is doing HSC um you know there's there's a lot going on we're running businesses we're at the peaks of our careers mm. you know you're trying to stay fit you're trying to stay healthy you're trying to have a, a happy marriage um and we're being constantly bombarded and I think that this is an incredibly important thing that a lot of us don't realize is what happened in the rest of the world, the stressful events that happen all around the world never used to be like smack bang in the middle of our faces from the moment we woke up in the morning. We didn't have our brains it. are just getting a live stream feed of disaster and war and terror yeah. and everyone else's opinion. Um, it's it's a it's a massive data stream and the brain is co- the, the brain is constantly being fed and having to make meaning of alongside mm. just everything else that is going on. Um, and our brain just, you know, you know, tries to make meaning of all sources of information about what is threatening <laughs> and what should I be doing and thinking and feeling about mm-hmm. not just the hormone status of my body <laughs> and yeah. my kids going through school, my aging parents, but we're expected to have a, an impassioned opinion about every global event and, and feel deeply and meaningfully about it. And it's just too much. It's too much. I'm so glad you said that, Sarah. It's such an important point, and I think people probably don't even think about that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I mean, we didn't evolve to know what was happening outside of our actual, you know, ability to see what we can see yeah. <laughs> around us, including the people we live with and the rising and setting of the sun, you know, our, our immediate environment, what we can hear mm. and what we can, and if it's close enough to us, what we can feel and taste and smell that's how our brains evolved basically move us through our immediate environment and interact with that not not the data that we are receiving streaming and live from other lands which of course is important but I don't think that we realize how how an incredibly how incredibly stressful that is because we're expecting ourselves to also make meaning of that Mm, mm, mm. and if you ignore it you feel like guilty or something I don't know. or left out or not yeah 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 and you know there's there's a lot of opinions out there about everything and who <laughs> needs <laughs> those we've got <laughs> a lot of our own opinions <laughs> yeah. yeah so then what are a couple of things that women at this midlife stage can do to improve their brain health I think if menopausal, perimenopausal symptoms are distressing, and there's a big conversation at the moment about the language we should use around this, Mm -hmm. and I think it's important that the meaning we make of the experiences we have, including in our bodies, um, are are, are really important. And what may be incredibly distressing to one person might be completely, someone else might not even worry about. So I think understanding that, your experiences are the meaning that you're making of what is happening. And, and, and if you're distressed, <laughs> you, you need help. But if something isn't distressing, you're not kind of missing. You know, I kind of feel like women are being bombarded with information about menopausal symptoms as this, as this kind of, and it was, and I, and I quote from very, very old literature about menopause being a galloping catastrophe. And I don't mean that in any kind of belittling way, but we are constantly being bombarded with information about this as well. And I think also we need to think about the meanings we're making of the information we're receiving. Um, and then fear, and then when you've kind of done that, like I think if you've got to around 50-ish, <laughs> you haven't got a good open relationship with a medical health professional in which you can have a good conversation with, talk through risks, benefits. Do you want to go on hormone therapy? Can you? Do you not want to? Can you can you kind of discuss those options openly with someone? And if the relationship isn't working for you, move on and find someone else. I know that doesn't always work. You live rural, or remote, whatever. Um, but I, I do think it's kind of a time in life when it's useful to develop a relationship with a health professional you can trust and have a good conversation with. Very good. Um, 
so, so there's that kind of meaning making of this phase of life. I think the second thing is, and it doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're you know, 80 or whether you're eight or eight months old, is, is sleep is the kind of foundational bedrock of good health. Yeah. Um, and we're just starting to understand sort of neurologically why we need to sleep. And the brain is kind of flushed out of all the metabolites that it's built up during the day. It's kind of cleansed when we are deeply asleep. And it's also when our memories are consolidated. Um, sleep's almost the price we play. We 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 play for for brain plasticity, um, and it's so important to understand kind of not just the basics of sleep hygiene. You know, have a nice cool room, relax, wind down, don't look at your phone, um, but kind of understand how intimately entwined your, our circadian rhythms are with the world around us, with the rising and setting of the sun and how fundamental that is to the health of every cell in our body. And if you can get your sleep kind of reasonably well managed, um, whether that be taking a kind of a psychological approach or a, a physiological approach, um, I think it's 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 almost more important than anything because everything else, the dominoes won't fall over as easy yeah. um, and everything else will be easier to build on. It is harder to regulate yourself emotionally. It is harder to deal with anxiety and depression. It is harder to take care of your kids. It is harder to do your job. Mm-hmm. All Everything is harder without good sleep. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then I think the other thing is then, you know, social sort of support networks and stuff like our brains evolved to connect with other people who we can see face to face and touch and smell and if you want to taste them so you can um but but you know large parts of our brain are devoted to reading the social cues from other people yeah. um and i think you know it's a bit much sometimes to ask everyone to have like this rich social life when there's a lot going on but just understand how important social connection as we all knew what it was like during COVID when we were all stuck at home and couldn't talk to anyone else except our immediate families how that isolation was just so stressful in itself but you know it's a kind of a time to kind of build those social those social networks and understand how important mm-hmm. or how damaging perhaps loneliness can be and how important social connections are for brain health yeah, it's such a good point and it doesn't have to be difficult to connect. I mean, I'm, I've started going to the gym again after a bit of a hiatus, but I go with a friend and that's our chance to catch up and mm-hmm. work out together. And there are definitely lots of different ways that are fun to connect with people that, that yeah. might yeah. become a chore of trying to f- find five hours for your three closest friends every week. Exactly. And you don't, yeah, there's, the, there's a bit of pressure, you know, to go out and have a few drinks and a laugh, whatever. I've joined a community theatre group. Mm-hmm. A couple of years we put on a, a musical we're doing, We Will Rock You this year, the Queen Tribute. I can't sing. I can't <laughs> dance. I'm just here for the vibes. I, I sort of shuffle around in the back row of the ensemble with all the other mums of the suburb. Um, and it's just hilarious to kind of be part of a group of people with this kind of collective purpose. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some incredibly talented people. I just kind of like, I just like kind of being part of something and part of, creating something together with with people especially because I work you know I run my own business from home I haven't got workmates um you know my husband's great my dog was great but he died a couple of weeks ago <laughs> so it's actually lonely without him too I, th- I don't think we under should I ever underestimate um our little doggy doggy friends mm, absolutely I've recently joined an amateur orchestra and I love oh, it brilliant same thing yeah, yeah. So much fun. That kind of collective effervescence is so yeah. important, so important. Speaking the same language, on the same page, having fun, and it's not a, a big onerous commitment. You don't have to go night clubbing and stay up all night or, or drink or yeah, yeah, yeah. that stuff. It's another way of connecting. I think we've lost the sense of fun, actually. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And I think um, especially if you get to this point in your life and you, you've got you know, your kids aren't, you know, you're probably not wiping little bottoms anymore. <laughs> Having to volunteer for the primary school cake stall, you can kind of, you know, do something fun. Where's the purpose? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so just to wrap up today, um, Sarah, can you tell us about your books? If people who are going through perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause mm-hmm. are interested in learning more about their brains and what they can do or if there are people who are in HR roles listening to this or who are in a coaching role and what sorts of options they have for working with, with you in that capacity. 
Yeah, sure. Well, the girls are back there, the two sisters, I call them, <laughs> written two books on women's brain health. So this one's this one's more about the neurobiology of pregnancy and motherhood and how it sculpts our brains and changes our minds for the better. It's very shiny and pink, uh -huh. um, as you can see. <laughs> um, so this and this kind of, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tribute as well. I call them the women of steel to the kind of the, the Gen X and neuroscientists out there who are kind of leading the charge in terms of um, recognizing 0.5% of all neuroscience research is being done looking at women's health issues. Wow. Um, and a lot of them feature in this book. Um, it is about pregnancy and motherhood, but it's also about sort of the gender stereotypes we've absorbed and the messages we carry and kind of looks throughout the lifespan. And my first book, which I'm considering doing an update for, because it kind of came out 2018, I say as a womb to tune, there's a whole chapter in here on menopause and brain health. But thanks to the women of steel who are doing all of the good work in the neurosciences, there are so many new updates that are coming out all of the time within this menopause space. So this just kind of touches on the research of where it was sort of five years ago. But um I do try and provide as many updates as I can kind of um, through my other social media channels. So at my Instagram, LinkedIn, and also my blog, whenever anything new comes out and there's a lot of new stuff coming out, um, I'm, I'm providing updates to the, the info that's in this book here. Um, and I then, love that that's a whole of life book because it's it's yeah. great to think about one stage of life, but the context is what did I absolutely do? you can't look it's at kind of any points in the lifespan without looking at what came. So it starts in utero, it starts when the sperm meets the egg, and goes through till <laughs> Jean Calmon, who was aged 123. So I cover a lot. Um, and then yeah, I teach a number of um, continuing professional development programs in applied neuroscience and brain health. So I have uh, sort of three of the courses teach the identical curriculum in different formats as a self-study. There's a two-week kind of live sprint version on the, that it's all taught online and then uh, a, a sort of a slower paced 12-week version. So they're the Brain Coach Bootcamp and Neuroscience Academy. So they teach, that's a great introduction to neuroscience that's relevant to people's lives. Um, I teach a course in women's brain health called In Her Head which is a five-day course, kind of, again, taking that womb-to-tomb perspective, um, looking at the literature and having a lot of really great, open, wise conversations with all these amazing women who join um, about how we can integrate that work into their professional lives. And then I also teach the next course, which commences in Feb 2024 is called the Neuroscience Coaching Network or the NCN it goes by and I teach that in partnership with Dr Mary Collins who is a um, uh, she has a PhD in coaching psychology she works at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland used wow. to work in HR at Deloitte in Ireland and um, is a, into sort of leadership and is writing a book on um, emotional intelligence for dentists at the moment because she works wow. with surgeons <laughs> and dentists um, and we teach that and that's and sort of in three parts. So there's a, a, how can you take the neuroscience that we've learned in my prior courses and integrate that into coaching practice? Mm -hmm. So we take a look at different aspects of coaching, like self-awareness, the coaching relationship, goals and motivation, et cetera, and kind of look at how neuroscience can inform coaching practice within each of those kind of areas. Wow. And then we put everyone into triads, so into groups of three, usually geographical, but it kind of depends because we have a global studentship. We usually have about 80 or 90 people. Um, and then people, then they you kind of work together in your triad to come up with a neuroscience informed tool or practice. So some, we've had everything from coaching cards to talks developed and just everything that you can imagine working with mothers working in HR, working in corporate leadership, people in the prison system, people in the education system, just kind of how can they apply that neuroscience really thoughtfully and develop some kind of tool or, or new practice? And then we have an invited speakers series. So we've had in the past, we've had, we had Andrew Huberman a couple of years ago, who's an old friend of mine from my PhD days. Mm -hmm. um, next year, we have Scott Barry Kaufman, who's going to be talking to us, who's a psychologist talking about um, self-actualization 
Um, we have um, a, an amazing neuroscientist here in Australia called Maureen Irish who talks about memory and how our past experiences inform our ability to set goals and imagine the future. She talks about that in a neurobiological perspective. We have a researcher from um, University of Pennsylvania next year who's talking about the neurobiology of worry <laughs> and stuckness. What happens when someone gets stuck in their head? We have people talking about burnout, um, emotion regulation, sort of social networks, conversation science, how we can understand conversations from a scientific perspective and use that in our coaching. So it's quite a remarkable speaker series that we have. I'm really proud of how, how we've curated that. And um, everyone just has a good old time as well. It's very, it's great, it's great fun. Mary loves, she's Irish, she loves a good laugh, so do I. Um, so we try and have a bit of fun as well as the kind of the collaboration and community. That sound ama sounds amazing. And I think I know where my next year's CPD will be coming from. Excellent. That's we offer 40 hours of CPD and it's accredited. All, all my all the programs are accredited by the ICF for CPD hours. So that's so great. Sarah, thank you so much for your time today. We've covered a whole bunch of things related to <laughs> brain, but it's brain. <laughs> so interesting. And I think you, you made some really important points. And what I take away is we're not crazy. And we're not becoming demented. No, we're not. There are things that we can do to improve our brain health. And there's study that we can do to learn about our brains. But I think one of the really big things that came out for me is stop trying to do 10,000 things. We're not meant to be doing 10,000 things. And if we mm. simplify our lives and we take it a bit easier on ourselves and don't tell ourselves a story of what we should be doing, mm probably it's going to take some of the pressure off and we'll be just fine and healthy. Yeah, yep, absolutely. You've Thanks. got it. I couldn't <laughs> explain the brain well. <laughs> Thanks again, Sarah. Appreciate your time. You're so welcome.